Before I get into the video, I feel the need to show off my new shirt. This is a Fahrenheit 451 shirt, which I had mentioned that I was wanting, and I really love this shirt. It was sent to me by someone who knows who they are. Thank you for that. And now on with the video. Hello, lovely internet strangers. I realize that I interact with some of you on a regular basis, so you are not internet strangers, but perhaps internet friends. But based on the number of views that my videos get, the majority of you are still internet strangers. So hello. In today's episode of The A Squares Corner, I will be commenting on a piece by Katie Herzog called Where Have All the Lesbians Gone? She published this post in November 2020. I've been thinking about it a lot ever since I read it, and I figured this was perfect for the A Squares Corner, where I could just kind of freeform, say whatever thoughts come into my head as I'm reading it. I'm going to share a little bit of my personal experience with lesbians, lesbian identity, lesbian bars, etc. So get excited. So after the title, Where Have All the Lesbians Gone? The subtitle is They're Coming Out as Non-Binary or Men. So the author starts off by saying that her wife told her there are only 15 lesbian bars left in the entire country. And she replied, great, we'll each get our own. She says, lesbian bars have always been vastly outnumbered by bars for straight people and gay men, but in the 1980s, there were more than 200 lesbian bars in the US. What happened? Well, a lot of them sucked. The first lesbian bars I went to in my early 20s were dank, smoky caves where women in khaki shorts and backward caps grinded on each other to outcast. They could have been frat bars if not for the notable absence of men. I have thoughts on that. I'm going to come back to that. There's also the economic challenge of catering to a tiny slice of the population in fast gentrifying cities. This is what took down the Lexington, an infamous dyke bar in San Francisco's Mission District, where the tagline was, every night is ladies night. And there are the dating and sex apps. Granted, apps for gay men seem to thrive, while ones for gay women tend to be both anemic and unfortunately named. The first lesbian dating app was called Brenda, which sounds about as sexy as a house full of cats. It no longer exists, so I assume Brenda moved out to the country with her wife. Then there's the natural course of assimilation. You don't have to go to a lesbian bar to get a drink with your girlfriend anymore, because you'll be welcome at any other bar in the neighborhood. But there's something else going on right now because it's not just lesbian bars that are disappearing, it's lesbian as a category itself. This is something that I had also noticed and it wasn't until I read this article that I found someone who put it into words for me. It was like something that was floating on the edges of my brain, like something's not right and I can't put my finger on it and it's the disappearance of the use of the word lesbian and of lesbian community. After Portland's last lesbian bar closed in 2010, as Elena Rosenthal explored in The Willamette Week, there were attempts to start lesbian specific nights at various venues, but most avoided the L word to appear inclusive of trans and non-binary people. One event called Temporary Lesbian Bar apologized after being accused of condoning trans women exterminationism for using the labrys, a double-headed ax that symbolizes female strength and has long been a part of lesbian iconography in their logo, or did before COVID, but the organizers make sure to advertise that despite the name, it's open, inclusive, and welcoming to all people. Oddly, these fights only seem to occur around women's spaces, not men. If gay bars, bathhouses, and clubs go extinct, it will be because of COVID, not because of infighting over inclusion. Portland may be a parody of PC, but it's not an outlier. When I came out in North Carolina in the early 2000s, the term lesbian was fading and queer was rapidly rising. We're gonna get into my thoughts on the term queer. Most of my peers saw lesbians as stodgy, old-fashioned, and uncool, whereas queers were hip, edgy, and inclusive. Yet queer is vague enough to mean nearly anything, so the label says less about your love life and more about your politics. Amen, sister friend. Could not agree with you more on that. I've been saying that for years. The flight from lesbian has accelerated since. An academic in the Southeast who asked to remain anonymous told me that when she mentioned to a colleague that she's a lesbian, the colleague reacted like I'd confessed to being a confederate lost causer. She told me that the term is outdated and problematic and I shouldn't use it, so the lesbian keeps quiet about her her identity. It's like being in a second closet. Not long ago, it would have been the Christian right stigmatizing homosexual women. Today, it's also from people who call themselves queer. As lesbian has waned, countless variations have emerged. Not just hetero, homo, or bi, but pansexual, omnisexual, sapiosexual, oh my god, don't even get me started on sapiosexual, asexual, autosexual, and many more, each with their own little flag. The same is true of genders, with non-binary being the most popular. Asia Kate Dillon, the 
non-binary TV star who goes by the pronouns they, them, described the term as including those who feel that their gender identity falls outside the traditional boxes of man or woman. Dylan is one of the many formerly gay identified celebrities who have come out as non-binary, including Sam Smith, Judith Butler, Masha Gessen, and Jonathan Van Ness, who prefers he, him, but is okay with she, her, or they, them. Why be confined to just one? Where did this come from? As a term, non-binary doesn't appear in the academic literature until the year 2000. For the next decade, it was largely limited to queer studies. Then it leapt to the internet, spreading from Tumblr and queer blogs to the mainstream media and the general public. Loyal viewers will have watched my recent rant about Tumblr, so yeah, that shit was cropping up on Tumblr hardcore and then it spread like a plague into the rest of society. A 2017 survey from GLAAD found that 12% of millennials identify as gender non-conforming or transgender. In 2019, Pew Research found that one in three members of Gen Z knows someone who goes by gender neutral pronouns. That same year, Merriam-Webster's word of the year was they. While there's some overlap between transgender and non-binary identities, they're not the same thing. And for some trans people, particularly older ones, the notion of non-binary directly conflicts with what it means to be trans. And this makes sense. If your deepest desire is to live as and be seen as the opposite sex, why would you want to dismantle the binary concept of sex? According to the National Center for Transgender Equality, most trans people identify as either male or female, period. That's the whole point of transitioning. For some NBs, what the non-binary call themselves, coming out is often more superficial than surgical. It's an update posted to friends and family on social media. Maybe one that says, I'm non-binary and my pronouns are they, them. This tends to generate lots of likes. Non-binary people say that the identification liberates them from the prison of gender, but for others, it doesn't dismantle gender roles and stereotypes, it reinforces them. It legitimizes the idea that there's an intractable gender binary in the first place. Instead of saying, I'm a woman and I reject gender roles, NB ideology says, in effect, I reject gender roles and therefore I'm not a woman. Jocelyn McDonald, the editor-in-chief of the lesbian site After Ellen, has seen the NB ideology pushed by well-intended people and she worries about the unintended consequences. When we say that femininity is equivalent to womanhood, we leave no space for women, gay or straight, to be gender non-conforming, she told me. Butch lesbians especially have fought for the right to claim space as women, and now women are running from that instead of boldly stepping into it. It's another way of saying, I'm not like other girls, and it's demeaning to other women. Oh, we had the I'm not like other girls card thrown into the debate. This is not a popular position in some queer communities, and after Ellen is routinely accused of being transphobic. In 2018, Rhea Butcher, a non-binary comic, tweeted, you don't represent me or my friends, and your website is a sham. If you're not a lesbian bisexual website, you're a TERF website. And for those who don't know, TERF stands for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist, and is not, to put it mildly, a compliment. Butcher's tweet is typical and is part of what makes having this conversation so fraught. There's been no clear polling on the shift from lesbian to non-binary, and so my sense that the lesbian is endangered is purely anecdotal. But there are plenty of anecdotes. After I put out a call on Twitter asking lesbians for input, my inbox filled with emails from women who said vast portions of their friend groups have adopted new labels and pronouns, but none feel like they can openly discuss it, which is apparent by the number who asked to remain anonymous. All of them. Lesbians are pretty thin on the ground for Gen Z, a student I'll call Hallie wrote me. I have one other lesbian friend, and together we have collected reports of five other lesbians between the US and Canada, of which three are in our generation. I do not know how things were in olden times for the elder gays, so I admit that a paucity of lesbian friends may in fact be normal for 20-something gay women in left coast liberal cities, but I like to imagine there was some Arcadian past where short-haired women in Carhartts could gather in groups greater than two. Hallie doesn't live in Tehran. She lives in Seattle. Another young lesbian I spoke to told me she used to identify as both non-binary and trans. There's a really thriving, active online and in-person trans community and queer community, she said, but there's hardly anything for lesbians. And if you try to create that, you get pushback. It's not cool to be a lesbian in the same way that it's cool to be queer or trans or non-binary. Some feminists argue that women are so oppressed in society that opting out of womanhood is a way of opting out of oppression. I'm skeptical. Why didn't women do this decades ago when oppression was objectively greater? Besides, NBs are more likely to be Smith undergrads than, say, immigrants getting assaulted at the border. And there's another not so popular explanation, that it's a fad. I'm aware that this will be offensive to some people. The concept of a fixed internal gender identity has become sacrosanct, and it's viewed as something deeply personal and meaningful, like the soul. But humans are social creatures, and we are easily influenced by our peers. This isn't a moral judgment, just a fact, and I've seen how it plays out in my own peer circle. First one person comes out as non-binary, then another, then another, and then one day half the dykes you know go by they. Add social media to the mix, and fawning profiles of non-binary people in the press, and you've got yourself a mass cultural phenomenon. I ran this theory by a therapist who specializes in LGBTQ issues.
issues. She asked to remain anonymous, so I'll call her Tara. Tara told me that while the most common complaints of her young female patients involve gender identity, it's not an issue with older patients. The older ones struggle with their sexuality or their relationships, but aside from a few transsexuals with dysphoria, gender identity doesn't come up. And young women, in particular, are prone to social contagion. We've seen this in many areas. Eating disorders, cutting, exercising, yawning, strange fits of laughter, and even forgive the term, hysteria. When I asked Tara if social contagion could be the cause of the non-binary movement, she paused for long enough that I thought she may have hung up the phone. Yes, she said, but I can't really say that to anyone. The professional risks are too great. Many queers and NBs, of course, insist that it's not a social contagion, and they could be right. Maybe it's just the next evolution, a march towards a future that isn't male or female, man or woman, but gender neutral and non-binary. Everyone will go by they, and the traditional roles and norms that have held back women as well as men will disappear as sex-based labels end. Lesbian as a label might be endangered, but it's not like women, or whatever you want to call us, will ever stop loving each other. That, I suppose, is the optimistic way of looking at it. But for older lesbian activists, there is something deeply sad about generations of females who don't want to be lesbians, or even women. What do we lose when lesbians disappear? One lesbian in her 70s told me, everything. We lose our name. We lose our sense of self. We lose our ability to gather. And the more taboo it becomes, the less of our history gets told. In a millennium, people will be saying, we heard about these creatures called lesbians. They'll dig up our bones. But the bones, of course, cannot talk. There ends my dramatic reading of this article. You're welcome. I interjected a few times in there, but now I want to add some of my own thoughts. So story time, I'm going to share a little bit about my relationship to the concept of lesbianism. So I went to college in the late 2000s, early 2010s, and my roommate, who was someone that I had known from high school, identified as a lesbian. I didn't know this about her right away, but eventually she opened up to me about this. And once she opened up to me about that aspect of her identity, it led me to realize that, oh, I'm actually bisexual. It's a weird thing, but it really just never occurred to me. I think there've been a lot of things about me over the years that I just thought everyone was like this. And then it occurred to me that everyone is not like this. So I'd always found women attractive, but I'd never dated a woman because I'd never met any women that met my standards for dating, I guess. And in general, I guess I always just got along better with men. Then we started to do things like watch lesbian movies together or TV shows like The L Word and everything that was on Netflix, which most of it was terrible because there was not good lesbian content back then. Then later, after college, I moved to New York City and she was here briefly for a year, maybe two years. And while she was here, we would go out and we would go out to lesbian bars and lesbian nights. And it's crazy to think about that fact that Katie Herzog shared about there only being 15 lesbian bars left in the entire country. Three of them are in New York City. Even back when I was going out, which would have been 2012, 2013, there were only four lesbian bars in New York City. There was Ginger's in Park Slope, which was mostly a bar that had kind of room in the back for dancing on some nights. There was Boom Boom Bar in Woodside, Queens, which I never went to, which was largely like a working class Latina demographic from what I remember. I only went to Ginger's once, but the other two I've been to a few times. Primarily, my friend and I used to go to Henrietta Hudson in the West Village, which was mostly a dance club they had like a drag queen karaoke, I think one night, but there was a few nights that they had club style dancing. It was a small place though. Even back then, you couldn't fill a huge space with lesbians. And my experience of that bar was kind of similar to what Katie Herzog described of how it could have been like a frat party, except for all the women. Definitely the crowd at that place was older. By the time that I was there, it's like Katie Herzog said in the article that there was less of a stigma around homosexuality with every passing year. So you could go to other bars and be welcome there with your girlfriend. But this spot was more of a place for hooking up, I guess. Because if you go to a regular bar or a dance club, you don't know which of the women might possibly be interested in you. Obviously not all lesbians or bisexuals are going to be interested in you, but you don't even know which ones are straight or bi or lesbian just from looking at them necessarily. Especially as more lesbians became lipstick lesbians, I guess, versus just the butch ones or even tomboyish ones. So Henrietta Hudson was definitely a place where people were looking to hook up. So it was a little weird for me to be there because at that time I had a boyfriend. And I don't mean because I was dating a man. I mean because I was taken and the people there were looking to like hook up. That's true of any bar, but in that place it was more so. But I think that the reason that there were so many older lesbians there is because they'd been coming there for years. It was probably a place that they went in their 20s and now they were in their late 30s, early 40s 
days and still coming there because there's kind of like a community aspect to it. It was a women's space. I think occasionally I saw a couple of gay guys there, but they were pretty strict about the men in there that you get bounced out at the slightest hint of trouble. We also went to a few lesbian nights at other places. They might have called them ladies nights or something like that because like she said, it's such a niche demographic because the only people that want to go to a lesbian bar are lesbians or bisexual women. Straight women don't want to go there. Bi curious women maybe, but straight women don't want to go there. Gay men don't want to go there. Straight men don't want to go there. Whereas gay bars and gay dance clubs, I think you get a wider demographic, especially more recently, because straight women want to go there because the men there aren't going to hit on them, but they might tell them that their outfit is fabulous. Gay men obviously want to go there. And straight men might even go to a gay bar if they have gay male friends who bring them there for a birthday party or what have you. It may not be their favorite thing, but they would still go versus if a close female friend of theirs was like, come to this lesbian bar for my birthday. They'd be like, eh. You know, because men in those spaces are looked at very suspiciously, even gay men. So it makes total sense to me that I can Google gay bars in New York City and get an article from February of this year that says 28 of the best gay bars to go to in New York City, whereas you can literally count the number of lesbian bars on one hand. The other lesbian bar in New York City is the Cubby Hole, which is exactly like it sounds. It's really tiny and it doesn't have dancing. There's no room for that. It's just a bar. I used to go there sometimes for $2 margaritas on Tuesdays. They were very watered down, but they were $2. So you could get a few of them. And that space was definitely like a lesbian community space. As of right now, only Henrietta Hudson and the Cubby Hole are open. Ginger's has been closed since COVID and it's unclear if it will reopen. And Boom Boom Bar closed down maybe a couple of years ago. And I'm not super tuned in to the ladies nights anymore, but I imagine it's exactly like Katie Herzog says that there's much more focus on them being inclusive. And it was interesting to me, her point about this only happening with women's spaces versus men's spaces. And I can speculate on a bunch of reasons for that. I mean, we don't even really see in the discourse a debate about what it means to be a man. We have a debate about masculinity and what's toxic masculinity and what's not and how men should behave. But I feel like in most of the discourse around gender and gender identity, we end up in these debates about, well, trans women are women. Whereas you don't see as much emphasizing of trans men are men. See, I don't know if I have any gay men watching me, but I can't imagine that gay men give that much of a shit if a trans man came into a gay bar. And it depends whether the person passes or not, but if they pass as a man, whatever. But even if they don't, those spaces are more inclusive. But then I also feel like gay men would be a lot more relaxed about just being like, you don't have a dick, I don't wanna fuck you. And other men in the community would back them up on having that preference and hard line about who they fuck and date and wouldn't be trying to police them about, well, that's a man just because they don't have a dick. What, are you some kind of bigot? I just feel like men don't really do that kind of social policing the way women do. So I wonder if that's a part of it. Other possible factors are an attempt to scale empathy, the kind of empathy that works really well for a small social circle or family, but doesn't work when you try to scale it. So women have all this empathy and they see these trans people who want to be thought of as women and how can we make them feel bad about themselves and tell them that they're not women and they're not welcome here. We have to welcome everyone. It's not just enough to not exclude people actively. We have to make them feel included. Because I never got the sense that most lesbians wouldn't allow trans women in their bars or spend time with trans women. They just don't want to date them or have sex with them because of their particular genital preferences, so to speak. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe, and I will have more content for you very soon.